think we'll get started now. Hello and a very warm welcome everybody to the Direct Air Capture Summit 2021. My name is Hannah Wise and I'm your host for this afternoon's event online and our in-person event uh, tomorrow afternoon. Thank you uh, for having me. And today's summit really couldn't have come at a more opportune time because it's almost exactly a year since the last Direct Air Capture Summit. But as many of you will know, it's come hot on the heels of uh, the uh, facility ORCA being started up. And I know that many of you already know that uh, ORCA is the world's largest direct air capture facility, and it will remove up to 4,000 tonnes of carbon every single year and store it uh, permanently uh, underground. But not only that, this summit's also coming just before COP26, which is being held in Glasgow, Scotland, my home country, in just a few weeks' time. And we're going to start to see that the conversations around direct air capture are changing. It's increasingly being seen as a crucial part of the solution to climate change. And certainly that's what we're going to address over the next two days. Uh, we'll really be looking at how we can accelerate the carbon removal market. So tonight we have two sessions, two wonderful sessions for you. The first one looking at what is carbon removal? What is direct air capture? And then a little bit later, we'll be speaking to the innovators who are developing the technology that's actually making it all happen in real life. But of course, this would be nothing without you, our audience, and we're very much looking forward to interacting with you. If you have a question for any of our panelists, then you need to pop it into the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can also upvote some of the other questions that are being um, asked so that I can ask the most pressing questions, the most pertinent questions to our panelists tonight. So let's get started. And our first session today is why carbon capture? You know, what is this technology? Why do we need it? And how is it really going to make a difference? Our first speaker I'm delighted to welcome is Jan Wurzbacher. He is co-CEO and founder of Climeworks. Jan, the stage is yours. Well, thank you very much. Hannah, and uh, also a very warm welcome from my side to all of you who have joined us today to this second Direct Air Capture Summit 2021, which we are happy to host again here in Zurich this year. Well, I've actually, uh, looking at the counter, I'm, I'm really quite impressed. We've, we've passed the, the 500 quite a while ago, so really a huge audience. Doesn't feel like that if you're speaking just to a camera, but uh, this, this number is really impressive to me, and I think it it somehow reflects what, what the developments were last year. Well, one year has passed since we did this for the first time, the first Direct Air Capture Summit 2020, and it was quite, quite a big year in, in my impression. When we assembled here last year, well, a couple of corporates out there, there, there were, there were quite, a, quite a couple of companies with net zero pledges, net zero commitments, some of them with even net negative agendas. But it was, was a different world than today. Very, very few pioneering customers had considered investing into carbon dioxide removal or more specifically into, into direct air capture. So that was really only at the beginning. Now, what, what has happened uh, since then? I would say in the last year, really the number of companies, we see a couple of logos here on, on the next slide, like the companies with net zero pledges, net negative pledges, carbon negative agendas has nearly exploded. And actually many of them have considered or have actually done uh, an investment into direct air capture, into other carbon removal solutions or have released RFPs uh, out there. So, so really a lot more momentum than we've observed before. And then also on the right hand side, IPCC, very well known logo, I would say in the really latest report of the IPCC, they have urged us in an unprecedented clarity, and as, as, as we haven't had it before, that we really need to take action if we want to take or achieve climate targets. So that's that's been the last year in a very short summary from my end. Now, here at Climeworks, I want to lead in with, with what our vision is. Our vision is to inspire 1 billion people to remove carbon dioxide from the air. 
1 billion, that's quite a big number. I've been asked by many people, hey, that's a lot. That's one out of 10 people on earth. Yes, it is a big number, but to connect this after what I've seen in the last months and the last year, I personally believe that's actually quite an achievable, achievable number if I think how many people feel that they are concerned with this topic. So this is, this is where, where we stand and, and how it feels to me personally being in this domain for more than 12 years now and having seen uh, many, many developments which were not nearly as fast as they have been in the last months and, and the last year, so to say. Well, to start with, just a quick reminder, in particular for those of you who are not so familiar with the topic, I want to dive briefly into this figure that you're seeing here, which is a figure we bought from, from one of the recent IPCC reports. The question here is, why should we care about carbon dioxide removal from the atmosphere? Why should we care about direct air capture, as the title of today's event is? And uh, well, what do we need to do? How can we keep global warming at below 1.5 degrees Celsius? What you see here, very simply, that's a graph with two axes on the horizontal, that's time. So you see basically the current century here, 20, beginning in 2010, ending in 2100. And then on the vertical axis, you see the global total CO2 emissions in CO2 equivalent. Today, we are at roughly 40 gigatons, so 40 billion tons a year. And what you see on top, that's the red curve. That's the business as usual scenario. So that's where we're currently heading if we more or less continue where we stand. And there are even more pessimistic scenarios where it goes further up, but let's take that as business as usual. And then the blue curve, that is the required amount of total emissions, a, a required trajectory that would lead us to 1.5 degree global warming or limit global warming to 1.5 degree. That's what climate scientists tell us. And now the question is how to get there. Well, there is a big chunk we need to do by reduction. So to reduce as much as possible, that's what it says on the right-hand side. That's the, the dark blue part that we can cover there, or actually the, the light blue part of avoided emissions or conventional mitigations, such as renewable energy replacing uh, fossil powered uh, power plants and so on. But then that is not enough because they will remain unavoidable emissions. So that's, that's reason number one, we will need to cover up for unavoidable emissions by negative emissions or carbon dioxide removal. That's, that's point number one. And also as climate science tells us, we need to go eventually negative. So the blue curve hits the net zero point somewhere mid this uh, century, and then it dives below the zero. So in order to need to achieve negative emissions, we need carbon dioxide removal at quite a substantial scale roughly numbers that, that, that are currently uh, the idea that we need to take care of in mid of the century is 10 billion tons of CO2 each year removed from the atmosphere. So, so that's the big why, that is where we are coming from. Now there are several approaches, several ways, uh, but only a few of them are on its way to be established, let me call it like that, to remove CO2 from the air. There are bio-based solutions, nature-based, land-based solutions. You can, very simply speaking, plant trees, uh, which capture CO2, then you have to take care that uh, you need a lot of area and, and, and protect them uh, to, to be there for, for a long time. You can also have biomass that you then burn uh, and then store the CO2 from burnt biomass that is called bioenergy and carbon capture and storage, BEX in a short form. And then there is direct air capture combined with storage. That is what the three presenters here today are doing. Now, getting zooming into Climrox, how we are doing that on our end, we are following a technology which is based on a solid sorbent material. It's in the end a very simple system. If you just look at it from a physical standpoint, uh, most of you have probably seen in some of the pictures a Climrox plant, which are made of these containers. You see the, uh, there are these individual modules. The magic, if you like, happens in the modules. There's a solid sorbent material inside in the individual containers, which is symbolized here on the slide then that's a two-step process that happens. So in step number one, we pass air through the filter, CO2 is bound at its surface. And then at some point we close the box and a second step, we heat it up. And by heating it to around 100 degrees Celsius, the binding of the CO2 is again loosened and we can extract pure concentrated CO2 from the filters, which can then be handed over for storage or also for other applications. And we start all over again. Two main characteristics of this process. First, or of the whole of the solution of the technology, it is modular, it is very modular on purpose. That is why we believe that is very highly scalable. In the same way, if we just take an historic example as solar PV, which is the most modular way of making renewable energy has been proven to be one of the, if not the most scalable renewable, uh, renewable energy production solutions. So by 
focusing on mass manufacturing of individual modules. That's something that kind of industry and humanity has proven that we can be good at scaling. And the other advantage is that we can work in relatively fast development cycles. So roughly every three years, we can come up with a new improved generation of our um, solution of our technology that's learned from the previous one. Um, that uh, said, also the other main characteristic, solarly renewable energy powered. So since we need electricity and low temperature heat, uh, it is feasible to, to power these systems by, yeah, as for example, geothermal heat as we do it in Iceland or other renewable energy sources. Now at Climeworks, we've done that uh, for quite a while. As you can see on the next slide, there's this nice map. We've built since 2009, roughly 15 plants, some of them rather smaller demonstration plants, but a couple of major plants, the first commercial one here in Zurich, uh, and then now the biggest one in Iceland. Uh, most importantly, collected a lot of experience with them and more than 25,000 hours of operational experience in different climates. So from Iceland to south of Italy, we've spent a lot of focus on life cycle analysis. So the gray emissions and several studies have shown that only about 10% gray, gray CO2, so to say, is emitted when operating our plant through the operation, through the energy required for the plant. So if you capture one ton or remove, capture one ton of CO2 from the air, then only about 100 kilograms are produced by, uh, by the operation of the plant, its production, and so on and so on. And just as a number Climeworks, we are around 150 people, headquarters here in Zurich, uh, with subsidiaries in Germany, in Cologne, in Iceland, and in Norway. Done with that. Well, one picture, we will speak a bit more on that uh, tomorrow that you see on the next slide, our latest, uh, well, Jewel, our latest baby that we inaugurated together with the Prime Minister of Iceland last week. You see two uh, quite impressed people there in front of that. That's Christoph and myself looking, looking at our plant last week uh, when, when we started. As we speak, that plant is capturing CO2 from the air and we are injecting that into ground, into the ground in Iceland where it's safely stored. How does that work in Iceland? And we have a small symbol there on the next slide where we can see in the middle, that's the Climeworks plant. On the left-hand side, that's the geothermal plant providing power and heat. And the nice thing is here that we partnered up with the team of Carfrix in Iceland. They have developed a nice methodology of CO2 storage. There are many ways for storing CO2. In that particular method, the CO2 is mixed with water, injected underground, and the CO2 is then permanently turned into stone within just two years. I've just... Uh, uh, so one of these stones here, you see that's a drill core, it's, it's black basaltic rock, and there are some white pieces in there, you can, I think you can see them, that is mineralized CO2, so that's basically carbonate that is produced underground, and therefore it's very safe, and the good thing is it's also very scalable, only in Iceland, and around Iceland, there is space for thousands of billions of tons of CO2 to be stored in that way, so storage space is really not the bottleneck. Now, in the beginning, going from technology to market, I've spoken a bit about uh, the developments. Just to add a few numbers here, there's a thing called uh, Science-Based Targets Initiative. And just to put, put numbers to what I said in the beginning, uh, about 1,800 companies uh, are, have subjected themselves to the Science-Based Target Initiatives, plus 400 alone in, in 2020, uh, much more and more to follow. And this, this represents about 70% of the global economy, which is quite a big number. If you think about the market, the, the total addressable market that we're speaking for solutions as we are providing, others are providing in general carbon dioxide removal, that's really a big topic. I think that's the key message of this slide. Looking a bit closer in recent developments of, uh, of companies who've made commitments on the next slide, we see a short timeline looking, zooming in what happened last year and this year when we held the summit last year, only Two very pioneering com companies have made purchases in carbon dioxide removal with technical solutions with Stripe and Audi. Since then, the hit rate has become faster and you see just a couple of names of, of large and well-known companies who've decided to invest into carbon removal with several companies, uh, several of them being here today, uh, us amongst them, others amongst them. So this has been just quite a accelerated development, also being picked up by the media, accelerated by a few of well, a few famous faces, uh, Jen, uh, just, just to give two examples, Elon Musk has kicked off the Carbon X Prize. Obviously, obviously, that's been picked up a lot. Bill Gates has decided to remove its, his personal emissions of CO2, uh, amongst others, with the Climeworks solution. So those were big things, big developments on our end. And in particular, we have addressed also everyone like you and me. So all of you could go to the Climeworks webpage and 
uh, submit or uh, sign up for a subscription where we can remove CO2 in your name, a really nice thing to check out. And since the beginning of this year, we've been able to double the amount of pioneering private customers with about 8,500 people having us remove CO2 for them in, in their name, which is also a nice development and working towards our goal of inspiring 1 billion. Still, still a moment away from that number, but uh, working on that. So no pressure on our uh, promoters of, of that one. So what's, what's next? Uh, to finish up, uh, just briefly on our roadmap, uh, some of you might have seen this slide before. Where are we standing? The ORCA plant is in operation as we speak. Further, as we speak, we are in execution mode of a 10x scale up of that, which will be operational in three years from now. Maybe we can even be a bit faster than that. So that'll be a at least 40,000 tons per year plant. In the next few months, we will tell where this will be. And then another 10x scale up, 5 to 10x scale up, is currently in the development phase, which will then be the third generation of our technology. The first one was built here in Switzerland. The second generation is, is the Orca plant, and then that'll be the third generation, which will then lead us towards multi multi megaton scale by the end of this decade. That's the that's the pace that we believe uh, is is a feasible one, and which can lead us then to eventually billion uh, yeah billion tons so gigaton scale by mid of the century. What is next for today? And uh, thereby introducing what, what will come here, uh, a few logos, many of them well known by you. So I'm very happy and curious to hear um, in the following two talks from Carbon Engineering and Global Thermostat, the two ones who've been uh, together with us in this space for quite a while on their latest progress and uh, what, what they have to report uh, on, on the last year. Curious to hear if, if you guys share my, my perception of the last year. Uh, we'll, we'll find that out in a minute. And then also a handful of companies, most of them have not been in the space for so long. And therefore, I'm in particular curious to hear what they have to, to show us about recent developments, new developments, new ideas, and new concepts. So we'll say hello to Heirloom, Mission Zero, Carbion, Carbon Capture, Solitaire Power, and Air Capture in the second session of today. So very much looking forward. And with that, I'm handing back to Hannah for the moderation. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Jan. And we're getting a lot of questions on Orca. So we'll get into that in a bit more detail a little bit later. But our next speaker is Amy Ruddock. Now, she is Vice President of Europe for Carbon Engineering. And um, Amy, what's your take on what we've achieved in the last year? Yeah, I'd start off by just saying thank you very much for welcoming me here today. Thank you to Climeworks for hosting and um, many congratulations on your launch of Orca last week. And um, I think a summary of my talk is I do indeed share your perception, um, Jan, and I'm very happy to talk about it. I think as Jan has spoken about, scientists tell us that billions of tons of carbon dioxide are going to need to be captured from the atmosphere this, this century um, and permanently uh, removed. If you just hop to the next slide, um, direct air capture is essential for the scale of reductions and removals that will be needed. It also caps the cost of decarbonisation. Today's focus might be on the hard to decarbonize um, sectors. For example, on this chart, you see the transport, the buildings, the um, uh, including aviation over towards the right-hand side. Um, I think you might have to click through the dots. I'm, I'm afraid there's some, um, there's some um, graphics moving. But of, of those hard to abate sectors, around five gigatons cost more than $250 per ton um, to abate. And then tomorrow, the focus will also be on those industrial residual emissions, which are hard to abate, let's say the last 5% of those industrial processes. And of course, climate restoration. We are not at safe levels of CO2 in the atmosphere today. So next slide, please. Carbon engineering has disrupted direct air capture technology that is ready for large scale deployment at an affordable cost. Um, the company was started in 2009. Our business is around the direct air capture of carbon dioxide that can then be used to sequester permanently underground and create that negative emission. Or the CO2 that we capture can be used in products, for example, transportation fuels, um, such as dropping compatible aviation um, fuels. And then onto the next slide. 
Our focus has been deployment at the megaton scale, and that means facilities that are capturing a million tons of carbon dioxide per year um, for the uses that we've just spoken about. In order to do that, we've made some choices, some of them technical, some of them business model. Just to talk through the technical choices first, we use proven industrial equipment that has been used in a number of sectors for a number of years beforehand, and we redeploy it for the use of direct air capture. So taking as an example on the slide here, you can see the first stage of our process is our air contactor, where we draw in the carbon dioxide using large fans. It's based on industrial cooling towers. Those industrial cooling towers are used for heat transfer. We use it for mass transfer, but fundamentally you've got that supply chain um, that can supply the equipment. The second choice that we made is we use a commodity solvent, potassium hydroxide, and very simple chemistry. And by doing that through two closed chemical loops in the capture, we have very little makeup, very little waste during the process. The final technology choice is our technology is of course part modular. When you're looking at a million ton scale facility, you're talking about deploying a hundred or so of, of these air contactors. And then maybe just onto the next slide. Um, Jan touched briefly on the concept of life cycle analysis. So for every ton that we capture, how many creates a negative emission? Um, for us, we've published an academic paper and depending on the deployment location, depending on the configuration, we see that 90 to 96% life cycle analysis. Um, so to put it in very simple terms as Jan did too, that, that's your 100 kilograms as well um, per ton. Um, in early plant, part, plants that we're deploying, we're using a combination of natural gas um, and renewable power. Where natural gas is used in the deployment, it's 100% co-captured and included in that life cycle analysis. We're actually currently investigating the use of hydrogen to replace um, natural gas uh, within that process as well. And I'll talk a bit more on that um, towards the end of the presentation. So coming back to megaton scale deployment, I said that we made technical choices and we made business model choices. On the business model side, we license our technology. Um, our view is that we can't do this alone. We're going to need a global network of partners who have expertise in transport and storage of carbon dioxide. They have expertise at large infrastructure projects. So on the slide, you can see some, some of the projects that we're working on currently, and I'll talk through in a bit of detail detail on a couple of them. Um, just to point to the one on the left hand side, we will very soon be commissioning our innovation centre um, up in Squamish, which will be the world's largest dedicated um, direct air capture R&D facility. And we expect to start the first air to fuel commercial design phase in North America by the end of the year. But maybe to just deep dive on a couple of these projects that you see on there, I'll just hop to the next slide where you can see the, the first million tonne scale facility that we're working on out in the Permian Basin with our project development partners 1.5. Now 1.5 is a JV between Oxy Low Carbon Ventures and some strategic investors, for example, United Airlines. Out in the Permian Basin, we're looking at deploying this plant um, and we're currently halfway through the, the feed, so the detailed engineering phase. About 80,000 engineering hours have gone into this plant so far. And it should be operational by 2025. It's the first of many that are planned out in that Permian Basin location, effectively a direct air capture um, hub. And these plants will do a combination of permanent sequestration to government standards and also production of low carbon crude. So if we hop to the next slide, um, I myself am based in the UK. Um, over in the UK, our plant development partners are Storega. Um, Storega are formed uh, through four, um, four large infrastructure funds, GIC, Mitsui, Macquarie, and more recently Prudential. The Permian Basin project provides a blueprint for our international deployment. Um, up in northeast Scotland, Storega are the lead developers of the ACORN site, looking at redeploying existing infrastructure up in northeast Scotland for rather than the transportation in of that natural gas, the transportation out of CO2. Um, we're currently in pre-feed to the first stages of engineering of that project and are targeting 2026 operations. 
So if we hop to the next slide. Carbon Engineering 2 this year has launched our carbon removal services to enable both corporates and governments to be climate leaders and to use direct air capture and sequestration as part of their solution towards net zero. For its first plants, carbon engineering's prices start at around $300 per tonne for permanent measurable carbon removal from air to rock. Our initial customer was Shopify and a pipeline to be announced. Um, you'll also see that carbon engineering have a partnership with B0 um, and that is all of, um, that is targeted at more individual customers who want to look at their own footprint for, for small off techniques. So if we hop to the next slide, um, our customers are seeing direct air capture and sequestration as an essential tool in their toolkit for decarbonisation. Um, and it has substantial co-benefits. I know that Jan has talked about a few of them, so I won't go into many, but um, we talk about permanence. Um, once that CO2 is sequestered, it, 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 it's safely stored for millennia. I think also if you look at comparing direct air capture and sequestration to some other removal technologies um, and solutions, the lower land and water use can mean that we can achieve other goals at the same time, for example, rewilding. Um, it's also important to think about the jobs. Um, each plant can support in the region of 3,000 direct and indirect jobs um, in its construction and later operation. And I think really importantly to note, there is a huge overlap between the skill sets required to do that and traditional oil and gas. Um, in fact, McKinsey finds a 70 to 90% overlap in those jobs, so it really supports the green transition. So on, on to the next slide, I've spoken about um, direct air capture and sequestration in a little bit more detail. I, I also said that carbon engineering CO2 can be used for the creation of products, um, for example, air to fuels and dropping compatible transportation fuels. Direct air capture technology is an essential enabler to bring that to scale alongside green hydrogen. Uh, we see megawatt scale electrolyzers emerging. Alongside fuel synthesis, Fisher Trox has been done for years, alcohol to jet is being developed at scale by Lanzatech. Um, so very much for us, our strategy in, in that air to fuels is to work in partnership um, with, with the players in each of those um, steps. So then if we go to the next slide, I just wanted to mention a couple of high profile competitions that we're working on to advance air to fuels um, through both the Fisher Trucks and the alcohol to jet pathways. Um, over in Canada, we are finalists in the Sky's the Limit competition. Um, and in the UK, we are working through a fund from the Department of Transport to Think, to, to look at the feasibility of combining our technology with that of Lanzatech, so all the way from direct air capture through gas fermentation um, to alcohol to jet to produce that jet fuel or air to jet. Um, and in that, in, in that piece of work, Virgin Atlantic and British Airways are, are working with us as well. And the, what we are targeting is a hundred million litre per year um, staff project in, in the UK. So I think that brings me to the end of what I wanted to talk about in what happened over the past year. In terms of the path forward, just, just to recap, we are focused on the capture of CO2 for both negative emissions and also for those products. Um, the largest market we're seeing at the moment is the highly scalable ultra low carbon fuels. Um, we do seek to work in partnerships. We are looking for a, a global network of plant developers for offtake agreements um, and for working together to explore early adoption and trial projects. So thank you very much. And Hannah, I will hand back to you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Amy. And I'm just going to answer one of the pressing questions that has come in. Will the slides be shared? Yes, they will. Don't worry about that. In fact, this whole recording is going to be shared in the coming days after the event has come to a close. But our final uh, speaker for this session, I'm delighted to welcome Nicholas Eisenberg. Now he's a senior advisor for Global Thermostat. Uh, Nicholas, we're looking forward to what you have to tell us today. 
Thank you, Hannah, and greetings, everyone. I'm Nicholas Eisenberger, a longtime investor and entrepreneur in the clean technology space and a longtime senior advisor to the board of GT. Uh, on behalf of the founders of GT and the board and uh, my colleagues at GT, I really want to thank uh, Climeworks for hosting this uh, really special event. Um, I've been involved in direct air capture for well over a decade now, like some of you. And uh, this is really the only the third time that we've ever gathered as a community like this. And uh, uh, we did one, uh, the El Coast Institute did a Director of Capture Climate Mobilization Summit last summer in 2020. Climeworks did an, uh, their summit last year and again now. So it really feels like a, an important watershed moment, almost a, a, a growing up milestone. And it's just a real pleasure to uh, see old friends and many, many new entrepreneurs and uh, uh, stakeholders entering the space. Next slide, please. So I just want to uh, give you a little context for uh, uh, what I want to talk about today briefly. For, I am going to give an update on Global Thermostat. Uh, and I'm very proud of the work that we're doing and what we've achieved. Uh, but my primary goal here is to really share a perspective, uh, a larger perspective and a sense of urgency that I have gained in working with my colleagues at Global Thermostat um, the last decade plus uh, of toiling in this space. Um, let me tell you a little bit about uh, the founders. Uh, uh, Dr. Graciel Chichelnitsky um, was, is a uh, world-renowned international uh, natural resource economist, uh, development economist, uh, well-known for being the author of the Kyoto uh, Market Mechanism of the Kyoto Protocol. Um, a professor at Columbia, serial entrepreneur. Uh, my father, Dr. Peter Eisenberger, um, a Bell Labs physicist, also uh, founding director of the Columbia Earth Institute, at, and, um, and then uh, Edgar Bronfman Jr., who uh, brings uh, decades of global business experience to the table as our uh, primary investor and executive chairman. Um, they have all been motivated together from the beginning uh, by a real shared passion for addressing climate change at scale, um, equitably, responsibly, and sustainably. And I know that motivates lots of us in this space, but it, I, I just want to share very clearly up front that um, that is the goal for our company. It has been from inception. And I think you'll see that reflected in some of the things that, um, that I'm going to tell you about today. So next slide, please. So uh, there's been a number of references to the IPCC and other estimates of the, the scale of our task to address climate change in the time that we have. There's a number of different estimates on the screen here. Um, they're all relatively similar. We have to start removing, in addition to mitigating, in addition to lowering our carbon emissions, we, we have to start removing gigatons very, very soon. And um, I think that for most, if you're on this uh, Zoom, uh, you're probably familiar with, with these figures. But I, I want to share some opening thoughts uh, that hopefully aren't too provocative, but just to try to really put a, you know, put a point on it. What if these numbers are actually too conservative? We're, we're, we're already staring at very, very massive ramp ups in a very short period of time. What if, what if we need to do more? And there's people who think that we do, and there's a number of, of the integrated assessment modelers who are now looking at really what, uh, from a CDR perspective generally, and director capture specifically, what might be the scale of the challenge based on new information. But even if that's not true, even if these numbers are sort of in the ballpark, uh, the time we have is very short, less than 20 years. Uh, climate science tells us we need to start banging the curve in less than 10 years. You know, if we have to start banging the curve and, and really scaling up these solutions by 2030, that's eight and a half years. In eight and a half years, a single calendar quarter starts to matter. A month starts to matter. So uh, I would just say one message is that this industry and its stakeholders need to grow up and make adult decisions fast. <laughs> there, we don't have time to do an organic uh, evolution of this space. Uh, we're going to need public-private partnerships and people crossing organizational boundaries to collaborate in ways that have happened in previous times of either opportunity or stress, as we've seen in the last couple of years with COVID. So uh, I want to put out there that it's really not okay anymore for uh, leading organizations who have a stake in this to not have a plan for CDR and DAC specifically. 
not DSA isn't necessarily a silver bullet. It doesn't fit every uh, uh, square or, or round hole. It's, uh, it's part of a portfolio, but we need to get serious. And I think our industry needs to stop apologizing for itself and saying, look here, we, we, please love us. Um, not to say that we don't have a long way to go. We need help and we need your help. The, learn, the earlier that we get on the DAC learning curve, the better, the faster we'll scale. History shows us that and the lower it will cost for society when we really need to get big numbers soon. So that all sounds daunting, but it's all eminently doable. We've done this in history before, ramping up automobiles, ramping up trains, ramping up power plants, ramp, ramping up uh, airplanes, ramping up war machines. Uh, we can do this, and we can do it in a way that uh, contributes to a vastly more equitable, prosperous, and sustainable future. So I hope that helps guide some of the thinking here for the rest of our discussion today and tomorrow. And uh, let me tell you a little bit more about Global Thermostat. Next slide, please. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, our focus has been on optimizing uh, climate scale solutions. Really what we've done is iterated to try to find the most efficient performance at scale. Uh, as you can see here, I'm not going to go through each of these points, we've had a different version uh, across time that we've learned from and baked into our next version. And, and to the, up until recently, instead of focusing on taking orders, we have invested in continuous refinement so we can achieve the lowest cost and have a solution that can scale for climate change and be affordable. All that work is now paying off. And as I'll discuss briefly, we're switching to a parallel path now of continuing to improve our solution for efficiency and cost while also defining the, the right model to scale and getting it out there. Next slide, please. This is basically how it works. Uh, it's not so uh, uh, dissimilar in concept to Climeworks. Um, uh, we have a, uh, we pass air um, over a highly porous uh, honeycomb monolith contactor uh, that traps CO2 with a proprietary absorbent material. And then we regenerate that with low, cost, with low uh, temperature heat between 80 and 100 degrees C. Uh, some of the things that we think are key advantages of our approach is really lower capex and opex through uh, our use of ultra high surface area and low pressure drop and low cost can, uh, contactor and on we've really invested a lot on the regeneration side uh, to reduce our opex and the energy use through uh, the way we uh, manage heat so that's just the basic uh, of, of the way it works next slide please one of the things that we've also uh, worked on uh, at, at, from the beginning is, are there ways to be flexible across direct air capture and also where you have a source of flue gas? And um, we have come up with a direct air capture plus solution where it's almost exactly the same design as what I just took you through for direct air capture, but we inject a dilute flue gas about 1% onto the panels at the last step before the regen box here. You can see that on the screen. This quickly further saturates the panel and creates a number of exciting advantages for both mitigation and removal. First of all, it enables us to use low cost natural gas as the power source, which is installed in many places around the world. Um, it captures the CO2 emissions fully from that flue gas source and with very little additional capital uh, required. It has a very low carbon footprint and, and ultimately because you're saturating the CO2, uh, a reduction in net cost for, for actual net removal from the atmosphere. We believe this is something that not in every circumstance, there's a lot of advantages of pure direct air capture, but there's a lot of places where this might also be very, very powerful to, to, to be able to do the carbon removal at the scale that we need using the installed infrastructure we already have. Next slide, please. Again, here you can see how, you know, as we've gone from millimeter scale to commercial scale, our focus has remained on driving efficiency and lower cost by increased production volume per unit of capital and lower net energy cost. Next slide. So, uh, you know, cost, everybody talks about cost and it's a critical factor. Uh, and we're all working hard. All of the direct air capture companies here are working on reducing their CapEx and OpEx costs and we're doing ours in our own way. Um, but we believe fundamentally it's time to take costs off the table for this industry. Uh, learning curves and empirical history, such as Wright's Law, which you can see on the screen here, have clearly shown again and again that costs come down as deployments double. In GT's specific case, we've already identified many specific paths to what we believe will be a very low cost solution at scale, and some of them are mentioned on the screen. 
Next slide, please. Just want to. Uh, these are. This is a snapshot of some of the ma uh, pilots and demos that we've done. Um, we're now building our uh, 2,000 ton plant for the highly innovative fuels project in Chile, where we will take CO2 from air and hydrogen from water, powered by wind, and combine those uh, to make uh, synthetic fuel for for transport, uh, for Porsche, and in collaboration with Siemens and many other global players. Um, we're also working on a, an exciting new continuous embodiment uh, on the right here that we believe may be the right module to scale out. Uh, it's uh, got improved mechanics and performance. We're building our first unit. The, the monoliths continually rotate through a stationary uh, regeneration box, and that has a lot of advantages in terms of power draw and energy, energy demand and integrating heat and, and water recovery. So we're very excited about that. Next slide. I won't pause here. Uh, we've talked about, and others have spoken about the massive market opportunities in the circular carbon space. You know, our economy uses carbon-based products across uh, across the marketplace. Uh, we can. There's an opportunity here to replace fossil-based carbon with air-based carbon. And then, of course, there's a massive sequestration opportunity. Where we're seeing real growth in voluntary and regulatory-driven demand. Next slide, please. Here's some of the uh, projects. It's a sampling of the, uh, uh, the projects and initiatives we're working on. I mentioned the Chile project. Uh, 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 if we all hit certain milestones, that could grow to tens of millions of tons per year. Uh, that's the planned uh, objective for the project. Um, there's lots of interest, as uh, I think uh, Amy mentioned, and others in sustainable aviation fuels. And we're working with a number of major airlines on that. Lots of interest in durable uh, uh, carbon products, building materials, lubricants, and other specialty materials. And as I mentioned, growing uh, interest in sequestration projects across the board. Next slide, please. But as I close, I, I really want to emphasize again that we are focused on scaling for climate in collaboration, as Amy also said, with other market leaders. This job is too big, and we need to work together to get this done. So on the technology front, uh, we are working with Exxon and others on uh, how do we scale up uh, to gigaton scale. Ultimately, um, we are working with uh, a variety of other global players in the same way. Uh, working with the DOE, uh, we just won an award for a hundred. Uh, they designed for a hundred thousand ton uh, plant, um, and just really uh, building that robust technology so that it can be deployed at scale as quickly as possible in the time frame that we have. On the supply chain front. We're working with global partners in the materials business and in the global chemicals business to make sure there's enough supply of the raw materials that we need to be able to uh, uh, deploy at scale. We're also working with uh, the world's largest infrastructure and engineering services companies. Uh, that 100,000 ton facility design that we won with the DOA, we're doing with Black and & Veatch, and we're working with many other of the large uh, engineering services companies looking at manufacturing and deployment. And then finally, we're, we're also really uh, excited to, and it's critical to be engaging uh, uh, society on this. Uh, we can't do this alone. We can't uh, uh, assume we know all the answers. We have to bring society along with us, and we need to learn from society about what their needs and expectations of our industry as we grow. So I'm pleased to tease today that we're launching an independent, nonprofit, public spirited, climate focused, global spoke. Uh, global scope, uh, multi-stakeholder effort with industry peers, uh, really focused on educating, engaging, and mobilizing society around uh, direct air capture. This will be the first dedicated uh, platform uh, focused solely on DAC. It's not an industry association per se, but focused on supporting the growth and serving the needs of key stakeholders in the direct air capture ecosystem. We intend to be radically collaborative and work, work very closely with others uh, and partners and allies who are already, you know, have their oars in the water, whether it's on policy or other fronts. And uh, we're focused, as I said, on educating, engaging, collaborating, and, and mobilizing. Uh, and so I very much look forward to speaking with the participants at the summit about their needs and how this platform can serve them. My colleague Jason Huckman will be here uh, tomorrow, um, and so look for him and visit us at uh, uh, as you can see here, direct dacoalition.org. So thanks so much. I really appreciate it and look forward to the conversation. Well, let's get stuck in then, Nicholas. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, also joining, we'll have Amy and uh, Jan on board as well. And I can see a lot of questions. We have you know, dozens of questions coming in, but really I think one of the most pricing questions we can't avoid it is cost. Now, Nicholas, you kind of said that we really shouldn't be thinking about cost 
when it comes to this, but it's clearly incredibly important. You know, there needs to be some kind of, you know, decent price per ton for businesses to access this. So where do you think that's going to be and how are we going to actually reach that point? Uh, thank you. Very good question. And I understand the focus on cost. And of course, cost matters. I'm not suggesting it doesn't matter. I'm saying we need to take it off the table as an excuse for inaction, for not taking taking steps forward. We need to get deployments going and get to scale and we will come down the cost curve. History teaches us that again and again and again. The focus on we've done kilotons of uh, collectively of deployments of direct air capture. It's tiny. Right, and we're already within reach of something that society can absorb. We spent, I don't know, twelve trillion plus on COVID. Twenty trillion. I've I've no idea exactly what the numbers are on Afghanistan or Iraq. Trillions of dollars, and for that kind of amount, we're already paying for carbon abatement. Whether you're talking about low carbon fuels or EVs or other things that society says we value as, as, as a way to get towards climate change. We're already within striking distance on that. We need to keep working it down the cost curve, but stop using it as an excuse to wait. What about you, Amy? You talked about, you know, $300 a ton. What's the potential there? So I'd echo a lot of what, what Nick said, and I, I'd add carbon engineering has uh, disciplined um, cost uh, reduction um, curve that, that takes us to $100 per tonne. That is, that is our aim as, as carbon engineering to get to $100 per tonne. I think just to echo a couple of things that, that Nick said, I would take a parallel with, um, with computers and, and mobile phones. If nobody had those huge large scale room taking up computers, nobody would have a mobile phone that they're typing on today. So it is about deploying and learning. Um, I'd also take take another example he he talked about around what is your benchmark for what a cost is we are deploying climate solutions today who that are considerably more than that sort of 251 $100 per ton um in my first slide we looked towards the right and you, you thought you know in aviation um sustainable aviation fuels electric planes etc they are more. And then the final benchmark I would throw out there is um, mitigation. Um, what is the cost of going above 1.5 degrees, two degrees? Okay, so look at it on the flip side. Um, there's a lot of interest, Jan, and I see that you're joined by your co-CEO, Christoph there. Thank you very much. Nice to see you, Christoph Kipal there. Um, a lot of interest here on, on, the, on the discussion is about ORCA and the costs of investment there. What more can you tell us about the project? Just maybe first of all, just echoing what, what the others have said on, on costs to add one, one thing of that. I think if we talk about costs, we should really think of what, what is the fastest way to, to a low cost system between 2030 and 2040, not what is the cheapest system today, but what can uh, scale us faster, uh, fastest to, to, to that point. And I think that's basically what all the three companies we've been hearing here are uh, advocating for. As far as the ORCA plan is concerned, uh, what I'm happy to disclose, like, and, and again, I think today really what matters more is the absolute cost and not the relative cost. So how many million or maybe billions of dollars does it take us to get to this magic hundred dollars per ton, which everyone considers the, the magic number where the, where the lines cross or let it be somewhere between 100 and 200. But that's, that's I think, what, what we all agree on. Uh, so in terms of investment costs, the ARCA plant has, has a value of somewhere between 10 to 15 million, which is, which is a match in the eternity of darkness if we compare it to what the world spends on, on climate issues and other issues already, already today. What the relative costs are of ARCA, basically that's the reason why we build it. I, I can't tell you today, we will learn in, in, in the next two years. But then it's also not so important if it is $100 more or less per ton, but rather can it take us one year faster to a 10x and then a 100x scale up, which is then approaching this, this $100 to $200 uh, range, which, which uh, Amy, you said it for carbon engineering. Likewise, this is our goal to be somewhere in, in, in the next decade. And that range, uh, by the end of this decade, being in the range of $200 to $300 per ton with, with a couple of scale up, scale up steps. So that's, that's the road we're on. So we're investing that into ARCA to move towards this goal. Okay, and, and you also talked about the, the scaling up of ORCA as well over the years, the plans there. And I think that's probably um, quite an interesting point, Christoph, if I can ask you 
um, about where are we right now when it comes to direct air capture? Because, you know, I said this is quite an opportune moment for us to have this conference and that conversations are changing around it. And we are starting to see more and more interest in it. And we are talking about, you know, prices and costs and where we need to be. Do you think we're now at a turning point for the industry? First of all, hi, Hannah. Hi, everyone. Um, we at the starting line, right? With, with Orca, we, we put like we are at the starting line, we're just, we're just starting, we get momentum going. And maybe to, to answer the question from the end, like climate science says us, we have to be at gigatons in 2050, right? If, if we apply um, growth curves that humanity has shown to date, uh, we should be at megatons by 2030 to, to not miss the party in, in 2050. And this is precisely the, the starting line, so to say, that we've drawn with Orca. We, we do have this launch pad or we do have this platform that we can scale in two subsequent scale-up steps that uh, Jan was alluding to, to a megaton facility that in turn is, is the launch pad to, to really industrialize it. Like look at solar PV or wind in, in the 2000s uh, as an example, how that scaled with 20 to 25% uh, year after year and like this megaton launchpad all companies that that have spoken now all have in mind for 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 this decade uh, for the second half of this decade will then be really the launchpad uh, to to get this industrialized to to the gigaton in in 2050. thank you well christoph um mentioned there you know about the, the the situation with Orca, which is based in Iceland, but there's a great question here. I mean, how do we plan to address the challenges of energy in places that you know access to energy is not so simple? Um, I, Nicholas, perhaps you can jump in here. I mean, where where do we see geographical hotspots for this kind of technology? Sure. Thank you. I mean, I think it's going to be, you know, we're seeing a flowering of, of new entrants. And, uh, and I think there's going to be, I mean, there's a, <laughs> billions of tons of opportunity. And so um, uh, different folks might migrate to different uh, specialties, uh, whether you're talking about geographies or climate, but notionally, direct air capture can be done anywhere, anywhere there's air, which is anywhere. And so that enables you to uh, you know, really be selective in, 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 in where you place your solutions, both in terms of what the energy source is there, uh, in terms of what the climate might be, in terms of what your offtake or sequestration opportunities might be. It, it's tremendous flexibility that direct air capture brings to the table to free us from these point sources, which are also, you know, important things to mitigate for sure. But it's just a real game changer in that sense. I also would just say from, an, from a broader ultimately equity perspective, it enables more people around the planet to participate in uh, helping to solve climate change and enjoying the benefits from doing so. So I just think that is really important to keep in mind too. Thank you. What then, um, Amy, does carbon engineering ask for from governments, you know, to help them move, to help you move forward with this? Because I know that um, Jan said at the beginning it's about one billion people, but you know what kind of help do you need to get there? So I think ask number one is what I would say is that the major barrier today it's to create um, that market that gives you a financeable revenue stream. I mean I take parallels from waste management. So you know you put your rubbish outside your house, you're paying somebody to collect it and deal with it. Um, when you drink water, some of what you pay is the volume of water. Some of it is around the cleaning of the water. Somebody's been paid for cleaning that water. What is the revenue stream for cleaning our skies? Um, there needs to be that market created for, for, for cleaning up the atmosphere. And I think that is the role of government, to create that financeable market. Once you have um, that, that clear source of revenue, um, there are many different infrastructure investors who are, in, who are very interested in deploying funds toward these plants towards direct air capture. There are many interested companies in, um, in off-taking and making their own commitment. And the key is to, to bring it all together um, with that policy. So I think that's ask number one, that, that long-term financeable market. Ask number two, I think, um, also ties to what Nick was saying around the need for transport and storage infrastructure. Um, if you're going to be capturing millions of tons of CO2, it needs to go somewhere. Um, you see around the world, CCS projects are developing and the governments are, are starting to, to think about supporting that infrastructure. 
Um, but the growth of DAX at scale will also be dependent on, on, on that being built. So that is the second ask of the government to start rapidly deploying that transport and storage um, infrastructure. And, and Christoph and Jan, would you agree with that? Is there, is there more? Uh, yeah, maybe to, to overlay a time axis, if, if you want, to, to this question. Now, the, the question is, as, as Jan also mentioned, how are we getting to 2035 when what we are doing is competitive with everything else, with, for example, also competitive to internal prices on carbon of companies? And what, what we do see there, like we have this phase where we're currently in, which is a phase, we, we call it a pioneering phase, where both people as well as pioneering companies um, support the offtake of our plants. What, what we believe will be needed in the middle is a subsidy phase uh, that we have seen in, in other successful domains like solar PV or in wind, or that we're currently seeing in, in battery electric vehicles, say a, a 10 year phase starting mid of this decade that is helping to take off the the, the gap between willingness to pay from, from corporates, so to say, and the, the price that a techno, technology like ours has at, at, at that time. And to give examples from the past, like solar PV in, in the 2000s was receiving such, subsidi such subsidies uh, well north of $500 per ton with like support of billions of dollars annually over a time, a 10 year time frame, right? And this, this 10 year period really helped it help this like specific industry to scale, to drive down costs. And again, in, in, in this time axis, we see pioneering and like private sector driving it at the moment, then subsidies kicking in in certain countries and states of the planet, and eventually be in a position where we can operate on our own. Does it make sense to scale direct air capture solutions now, given um, the costs of, of energy? That's, that's quite a key question because there are obviously plans for scaling up, but is that the right time now? It, it's absolutely the right time, as I was trying to say. The, 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 I mean, obviously that's going to sound like an obvious uh, self-interested answer, but if you just look at the way technologies come down cross curves, you've got to get deployments out there for them to do so. Now we have not much time, but if we have to try to scale 10, 15 years from now, when we have to get really large, really fast, it's going to cost a lot more. We absolutely need to get those deployments out there now so that we can start coming down the cost curve. It just it, that's just the way it works. And as as uh, Christoph just said, this is precisely what happened in the solar uh, industry. And uh, that is a recent example that you know, should be familiar to everyone. It worked. We can do that again here. Now, just to add on that, we, we made this, or Christoph made this comparison before to the scaling curves that other industries have shown, and we've, we've compared it to where we are standing. Our conclusion is, if we start today, what we are doing, we can reach gigaton scale by 2030, uh, by 2050. If we start in 10 years from now, we will not make it. So an absolute yes, we have to do it. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm aware that we're going to run out of time for all these dozens of questions. So let me try to get to a couple as quickly as possible. How do you rate the technical possibility of combining direct air capture with air conditioning technology? I'm not sure who would like to answer that question. Christoph, I can see you smiling, so I'm, I'm going to throw it to you. <laughs> let's, let's call it interesting, uh, but not promising to reach gigaton scale. So currently not our focus. And clearly there's no free lunch, right? Like if we talk about pressure drop, if you combine it with a, a air conditioning system, the pressure drop happens somewhere else. So thermodynamics, there's no free lunch. Uh, interesting idea, but not uh, helpful for gigaton scale. But not yet. OK, thank you. And Amy, perhaps maybe you can jump in on this one. Um, what evidence do we have of this permanency? You know, once the carbon's been captured and it's pumped into the earth and it kind of solidifies and, and you said it hardens and it stays there for you know, millennia, you know, what kind of evidence do we have for that? Yeah, so I think I'd say it, it pumped in supercritical form um, into either depleted oil fields or saline formations. And there's typically a capped rock that prevents the the escape, um, and then you find a process of, of a number of years, um, you'll either dissolve the CO2 or it will be, or it will interact with the minerals already present there and harden. And I, I really like that Jan pulled up his, his example of, 
of the minerals. Um, I, I don't think any of us on the call are, are, are kind of the, the experts in, in that geology, but um, we, we're working um, with, with one of the experts um, up, in, up in North East Scotland on the, the projects that I mentioned very briefly called Dreamcatcher, um, but part of a, a government funded programme. Um, and Stuart Hazeldean is an expert um, who looks at the permanency of those solutions and has produced a number of academic papers. There are other academics out there, um, scientists who, who point towards it being um, millennia of, of storage. OK, thank you very much. Um, what are our thoughts or your thoughts on increasing um, the direct air capture market size? Um, tax incentives, community projects, growth markets, you know, even direct air capture charities, Nicholas, you know, how this is all about, you know, accelerating the, the, the carbon removal industry over the next two days. So how do we do it? Yes. <laughs> no, I mean, in all the all the above. I mean, this is a time for creativity. Uh, and, uh, and there's, you know, as you can see, and new entrants coming into the market, there's, you know, people are, are, are jumping in, uh, which is just so great to see. And uh, we need all, you know, we, we were confronted with a once in a century global pandemic. And I was comforted by, you know, I knew that the best minds in humanity were focused on that problem. And then look what happened. We haven't completely got beyond it yet, but we made so much progress in so little time. That's what we need here. We need the best minds bringing creative thought and new and lots of different ideas for getting there quicker. And and Jan, maybe if I can just wrap things up with you here, can direct air capture really impact the climate challenge as it is currently? It has to, and I think yes, yes, it can because we we have to capture ten billion tons out of CO two out of the air every year and. I don't know of any other way that can that can fully do that alone. The humanity has been really, really good at scaling technology, and I think that's that's a good skill we should take advantage of. Okay, well, I think we'll wrap it here. Um, I know that there are uh, dozens and dozens of questions that we have not got round to, and we'll be unable to get round in this session. However, um, of course, we always have tomorrow where networking events where everybody will be there and we can continue the conversation there as well. For now, we're going to take a short break, just 10 minutes now, uh, and we'll be back at quarter past six uh, Central uh, European summertime um, and quarter past nine over in the United States. Um, and then we're going to get to know our innovators and find out more about the technology that they're developing to make this more accessible and to make this happen. So we'll see you shortly uh, and stay with us. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Thank you. All right, a warm welcome back, everybody. I hope you've had a, a few moments to gather your thoughts and, and have a quick break. Um, thank you so much for all your questions in the first session. That was uh, incredibly interactive. Um, our next session, though, I'm very excited about because we're going to hear from those who are actually innovating in the sector. So these are the companies that are making technology to make direct air capture and carbon removal possible in reality. We're going to hear six three minute pitches from these companies, followed by a short discussion. So again, you can get your questions into our panelists, just as you did before by putting them in the Q&A box. And again, uh, we can upload them or upvote them, sorry, if you believe that they are the most pressing questions. So we're going to speak to our companies in alphabetical order just to make things uh, nice and uh, fair. So I'd like to welcome Matt Atwood, first of all. Matt, you're CEO of Air Capture. Thanks for joining us. Uh, your next three minutes are all yours. Thanks so much, Hannah. And um, thanks uh, so much to Climeworks for the invitation and putting the summit together. And of course, huge congratulations on the launch of the Orca project last week. Um, my name is Matt Atwood. I'm the founder and CEO of Air Capture. Uh, what we're doing at Air Capture is we're a startup developing and commercializing modular scale uh, direct air capture systems for on-site production of CO2 uh, at various qualities and purities as required 
uh, by the use cases and the customers that we're um, working with. Um, we're primarily focused on providing CO2 to small and medium-sized businesses, uh, such as breweries, beverage carbonation, greenhouse operators, things of this nature that are currently pur purchasing CO2. Um, our on-site strategy helps these existing businesses that want to focus on a more sustainable or reliable CO2 supply uh, shift away from supplies that are often produced via petrochemical processes, uh, which are trucked to site, uh, carry with them a significant um, uh, you know, embodied emissions and oftentimes contain uh, byproducts from the, from the petroleum production process, things of that nature. Um, one advantage of our approach is uh, the CO2 that we produce from our modular on-site systems can help companies decarbonize uh, the often hard to address scope three emissions in addition to directly uh, reducing atmospheric CO2, depending, of course, on each use case. Um, you know, from a philosophical standpoint, uh, as has been discussed earlier and quite often, um, the required install base of negative emission infrastructure uh, such as direct air capture to avoid catastrophic climate change is uh, quite large and uh, our time frame for doing so um, quite short. So as such, we're thinking quite a lot about things like high value manufacturing and, high, and how modular scale DAC can be enabling to emerging carbon to value industries, um, which is something that we're quite excited about and um, excited to work with uh, companies in that space. Um, at present, we're focused on developing a few projects. Uh, one will be located at the U.S. National Carbon Capture Center, um, together with the U.S. Department of Energy and a number of other companies. Uh, and then we have three active projects in the beverage carbonation application space, uh, one in the EU, one in the U.S., and one in Latin America. Um, with that, I will uh, hand it over back to Hannah and uh, look forward to answering any questions that may pop up later. All right, thank you very much indeed, Matt. Next up, we're going to hear from Adrian Corliss, who is Chief Executive Officer of Carbon Capture. The floor is yours, Adrian. Excellent, Hannah. So can you hear me? Am I, uh, I've been, I've managed yes, to sort of my technical problems. So <laughs> last minute. Okay, well, great. Well, thanks so much, Hannah. And it's, it's really a pleasure to be part of this today. Uh, so really quickly, uh, Carbon Capture, it's a relatively new company. We're a DAC technology player that's based out of Pasadena, California. Uh, the company was founded in nine, or 2019 by Bill Gross out of Idea Labs. And so for those of you who may or may not know Bill Gross and what he's done there, uh, you know, notably of late, uh, Bill Gross has also spun out a couple sister companies, uh, one called Heliogen and one called Energy Vault. So we really make up the third leg of that stool in terms of climate technology. Uh, so about a month ago, I took over from Bill as CEO. Uh, they brought me in to help accelerate the technology platform that they've been developing over the last couple of years. And so for me on a personal note, you know, some of you may know that uh, you know, I, I did spend a lot of time in the direct air capture field in the past. I spent about five years as a CEO of carbon engineering. And so, you know, that I've kind of gone and 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 done DAC when it was really hard. And now I'm really excited to be part of the DAC industry again in a, in a time when there's really some really, you know, some tailwinds that, uh, that, that weren't there a few years ago. So, you know, my main reasons for joining, you know, after really spending a lot of time with Bill and understanding what they're doing is that they really do have the ingredients to, to, to be able to be successful and quick, quite quickly build a company that's going to be, I think, one of the leaders in this space. And it really comes down to a few things. One is the access to capital. And so, you know, the company is, is, is very well capitalized. We have a world-class team of chemists, physicists, et cetera, and, and also some interesting partnerships with, with the like of Caltech, which is really helping us on our material science side. Um, and then finally, you know, it's really about the, the partnerships and, uh, and, and the customers that we're going after. And so we're still quite young, we're in early stages, but we have evolved some relationships which are gonna be really critical for us getting to market. So, you know, what do we do? Um, you know, not unlike some of the other people that have talked today, we we're developing and manufacturing really inexpensive modular material based direct air capture systems. Uh, and, and so, you know, in, in terms of, you know, our approach is again, it's, it's modular and it's really about developing those modular pieces into arrays to, the, to, to remove uh, really massive scale uh, CO2. Um, you know, in, in terms of how we're different, uh, one of the things that, that the company was able to do over the last couple of years was innovate around the use of zeolites as the core material for carbon capture. And so 
The, uh, for those of you that don't know, zeolites are really a stable inorganic compound. They're an absorbent used for gas separation at very, very large scale in all sorts of industries. And so what we've been able to do is, is build technology around the use of zeolites, which allows us to have a very clear path to an inexpensive scalable system. And so, you know, in, in, in going a little bit deeper into that, zeolites have, you know, they've been considered for CO2 capture for a long time. They have a great affinity for CO2, but they also struggle with an affinity for water. So that's really where a lot of the innovation of the company has been around that water, solving the water problem. And in fact, you know, it's really not just solving the problem, but turning it into an opportunity as well. So, you know, the systems as we've developed them are quite tunable. And so we have an ability to take and, uh, and, and choose the degree to which we want to exclude or include water in our capture process. So we can capture between one to five tons of water for every ton of CO2 that we capture. And that's uh, really particularly important in arid or drought affected areas where that could be a very valuable commodity or in cases where it's not, we, uh, we can preclude that and avoid the energy required for desorption. Um, the second in terms of the piece in tunable, which is or the tunable piece of the system is really around uh, the output purity or concentration of the product that we produce. And not all applications require pure CO2 and the thermodynamics of gas separation favor a lower purity stream. So particularly around applications like uh, mineralization or adding CO2 to building materials, that gives us uh, a, another competitive advantage in terms of playing with the thermodynamics of direct air capture. So those are the things that are kind of embedded in the way we're approaching this technology. So that's kind of the technical part, um, I think. You know, from a business perspective and not to get on a, on a soapbox, but you know, we really decided we're focused just on negative emissions at scale. Uh, we're not, although we could, we're not gonna apply this technology to point source capture and we're not gonna get involved in production of hydrocarbons. So I'll just not enough said, but that's just a decision that we've made as a company right from the very beginning. And then I think lastly, you know, as a, you know, although we have a global perspective in what we're trying to accomplish, you know, we are a US based company and, and we really are well positioned to take advantage of the current regulatory frameworks that exist, you know, like LCFS and 45Q, but I think also some of the emerging opportunities that, uh, that are coming with the, the Biden infrastructure plan that really could provide a leg up for direct air capture. So, so I think I'll stop there and really looking forward to the discussion. All right, Adrian, thank you very much indeed. Uh, next up, we have Hans Denev, who is CEO of Carbion. Uh, over to you, Hans. Yeah, thanks, uh, Hannah. Uh, good evening, everyone, or good morning uh, for some of you, obviously. Um, yeah, I present uh, Carbion. So I founded Carbion uh, two years ago. Uh, I'm currently also the CEO of Carbion. So yeah, there's a couple of slides here. We call it next generation carbon removal. So also Carbion, you know, like the two other speakers we just heard, we're in the business of uh, developing uh, a new technology for capturing uh, CO2 from air in a more cost-effective uh, way. Uh, so we named it uh, Next Generation Carbon Removal. Uh, next slide, please. So we're a team actually based in the Netherlands. Um, actually, I call as always a group of uh, enthusiast uh, scientists and engineers uh, bringing uh, or sharing a shared dream, I would say, which is really to capture CO2 from air in a, in a more cost-effective way than what's possible today. And so, And it's not just our team. Our team is just uh, about 11 uh, people right now, but we leverage really the ecosystem uh, of companies in the region here where we are in the south of the Netherlands and with companies like Philips and, and ASML who are very strong in the microelectronics uh, industry. And we are leveraging actually a number of techniques that have been developed for the microelectronics industry uh, to reuse those techniques actually to, uh, um, uh, to use them for the sake of direct air capture. It's not an evident uh, or it's not a, a very straightforward uh, way. Basically what we do, and that's maybe more uh, clear on the next uh, slide, um, we, we leverage what we call a, a fast swing process. And so we've developed a very thin membrane, just a few millimeters thick. Um, and that membrane uh, has a very large internal surface. Uh, we coat that with, uh, with amines like most of us uh, do, I think. Uh, but the difference here, uh, what we try to do is to do a very fast swing process, which means that uh, we absorb uh, CO2 from air for about 30 seconds, and then we regenerate uh, the membrane for about 30 seconds. So that's kind of a different time scale than most of the processes that, uh, that we know of, uh, of today. Um, it's a challenge from a megatronic point of view, of course, to do this fast swing. 
but that's where we leverage the uh, experience, let's say, from the megatronic industry here in the region of, of the Netherlands. Um, and we hope, of course, with this approach to lower the cost of the equipment and to lower also the energy consumption of this type of, uh, of technology. So next slide. And I think it's, it's really meant for mass manufacturing. Um, it's designed, I would say, for mass manufacturing. Um, and as I mentioned, it's really leveraging some of the latest technologies that have been developed for the semiconductor uh, industry. Uh, and uh, I think as goes for most of us, it's all about bringing together, of course, the best of uh, uh, machine engineering, uh, chemistry and, and physics. So that's what we do. Uh, and I'm glad to see this evening that we're not alone in doing this. So um, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed, Hans. Uh, next up, we're going to listen to Shashank Samala, who's CEO of Heirloom. Thanks so much, Hannah. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Awesome. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm Shashank. I'm CEO of Heirloom. Uh, I grew up in Southeast India, uh, where I saw firsthand impacts of climate change um, on very vulnerable people, uh, increasing frequency of droughts and cyclones. Um, we are a direct or capture company. We leverage carbon mineralization to create a low cost and scalable carbon removal. Um, so what is, uh, next slide please. So what does heirloom mean? Uh, heirloom as a word means, you know, protecting something valuable from generation to generation. So in this case, it's our planet and all the nature and species living in it. Um, next slide. So this technology is invented by experts in director capture and carbon mineralization, um, like Peter Kalman, Jennifer Wilcox, and our team uh, in San Francisco is composed of experts in industrial automation and technology scaling. Uh, we're about 18 folks uh, based here. Um, next slide. So actually you can sort of click through. So this approach essentially, um, it takes two approaches that have some downsides, uh, carbon mineralization and conventional director capture, and combines them to essentially remove the drawbacks of each. Uh, the result is you know, essentially creating a highly scalable permanent carbon removal and, and also being low cost. Um, next slide. So fundamental to our technology uh, are these naturally available low cost minerals, just rocks really. Uh, they're called carbonates, and these minerals are highly thirsty for CO2 in the air. Um, over geological timescales, uh, these carbonates actually sequester trillions of tons of CO2 from the atmosphere, which is actually critical to uh, helping maintain the carbon balance. Um, so it's, it's, these rocks are actually by, by themselves the, the single largest carbon sink on the planet. Um, so there's trillions of these carbonates available, uh, and, and you can get these for a pretty low cost, about less than $50 per ton. Um, so these rocks are effectively our sponge for carbon. Um, so a couple examples of these are car calcium carbonate, which is used in cement production, or magnesium carbonate, uh, which is used as a cl climbing chalk. Um, so next slide. So how do we use these minerals? Um, so, you know, we call it the heirloom looping process. It's actually pretty simple. And it's important to, to make this simple because uh, it's the only way to drive low cost, which is incredibly important to us. Um, so we start these, with these minerals on the left, and the first thing we do is we put them into, uh, bake them in a reactor, and, and the reactor is modular, modular uh, electric, it's powered by renewable energy, and what it does is thermally decomposes the carbonate into a pure stream CO2, which we sequester underground uh, permanently for negative emissions, uh, so, and the other thing it does is it produces these oxide minerals. Uh, which are highly thirsty for CO2 in the air. So, you know, if you just put them on your desk, they, they just start sucking up carbon, um, but they're kind of slow. So what, what we do is essentially allow them to, uh, we expose lots and lots of these oxides to ambient air so they can passively and naturally react with the CO2. So we don't have any fans or, you know, forced airflow It's completely passive. Um, and it, it takes about a year uh, to, to, to do this, but we invented some ways to enhance the speed of which they can do this uh, as fast as two weeks and now actually under two weeks. Um, so that acceleration is really important for the economics to work. Um, so essentially, you know, the challenge becomes how do we move lots and lots of these, uh, the, these minerals around? So we essentially what we did by using these uh, minerals instead of sort of synthetic chemical sorbents, we, you know, tried to 
turn this directory capture problem from a chemical engineering problem into a, an industrial automation problem, which, you know, it's, it's something attractive because for us, you know, there's a lot of uh, advances in the last couple of decades in agriculture and, and uh, robotics and warehouse automation, automotive, automotive manufacturing uh, that we could use to uh, standardize the system, uh, reduce costs quickly. Um, so, you know, in effect, these contactors kind of look like, you know, you have thin layers of, the, of these rocks um, stacked on top of each other. So, you know, imagine uh, cookie, you know, white powder on cookie trays and cafeteria tray racks. Uh, so they look pretty simple. Um, and next slide, please. So uh, currently we're looking for controls engineers, software engineers, and uh, process development engineers. Uh, and on the deployment side, we're looking to um, uh, find host sites to, to uh, help us break ground on, 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 uh, on our deployments. So if you uh, know folks uh, can help with any of these, please reach out uh, to hello at airloancarbon.com. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, so happy to answer any questions later. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Shashank. Uh, let's turn our attentions now to the CEO of Mission Technologies, or oh, sorry, Mission Zero Technologies. Uh, my apologies, Nicholas Chadwick. Hi, Anna. Uh, really great to be here. I, I think it's worth stating uh, from the outset that it's just it's just great to be sat along alongside so many people innovating and working in this area, given it's so important. So, um, hello everyone. I'm the CEO uh, and co-founder of Mission Zero Technologies. My name is Nick Chadwick. Um, Mission Zero was founded on the idea that obviously we need to solve climate change, but fundamentally there's something larger here that we'd like to solve. And that's how can we embed CO2 in the everyday products that we use to make our lives better? So for building materials, plastic, chemicals, all these kinds of things, we need to align the incentives of obviously making the, the world around us better, improving the human condition, but at the same time aligning those activities with uh, the actual environmental imperatives that we had to, to fight climate change, reduce emissions. And from our perspective, we think direct air capture is the way to do this. But fundamentally, you need a technology which is good enough, is fit enough, and can operate at the scales and cost points relevant to enable the alignment of these incentives. So uh, when we started Mission Zero, we very much focused on like how do you actually proliferate the technology in a market rather than being this is the technology we're going to pursue. And so for us, it was about how do you if you're going to be uh, selling CO2 and removing it from the atmosphere at scale, how do you integrate the uses of CO2 into that supply chain? And fundamentally, you need to get around the constraints essentially of needing uh, waste heat, natural gas, steam, all these kinds of things which we consider deployment constraints to actually proliferate them in a marketplace that already exists. And on the other side, we need to be making sure that it's cheap, it's modular, it has a compact form factor, and you solve the risks of CO2 uses fundamentally every day. And so for us, that then led us down a technical development journey of innovating, not um, around how you capture the CO2, but how you regenerate the CO2. So direct air capture is fundamentally a very simplistic process. You have CO2 captured in the medium and you release it as a high grade stream afterwards. And most technologies utilize thermal regeneration for this. So I guess even if we have this calcination approach where you're using electricity to drive those in a renewable fashion, you're still going to be thermalizing a large part of that and using that, that heat source. And so for us, we've pursued a, a technology where we can actually do this electrochemically, allowing us to regenerate the CO2 in the solvent that we've developed at room temperature continuously for three to five times less energy than, than most other direct air capture approaches around. So uh, in summary, we're now scaling the technology, having demonstrated this at a proof of concept level. Um, and essentially we have pilot trials planned from 2023 with the UK's largest user of CO2, making carbon negative building aggregates and allowing us to actually sequester CO2 at the same time as uh, also providing as a high grade commodity to industries. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Nicholas. Uh, our last pitch for this evening before we get around to our panel discussion comes from Petri Laxo, the CEO of Solter Power. Over to you, Petri. Thank you, Hannah. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, my name is Petri Lax. I'm the CEO at Solitaire Power, and we turn buildings into carbon sinks by capturing CO2 from building ventilation. And then we can turn that captured CO2 into valuable products. Companies founded 2016, and we got a seed funding uh, 2019 and 2021. And I'm really excited to be here today uh, explaining our tech. Next slide, please. I bet that every one of us has been sometimes feeling a little bit tired in a stuffy meeting room. And, and it's probably because of the CO2 in the air. 
And because of human action, the CO2 level in the atmosphere is getting higher. And at the, the same cause is, is causing the indoor CO2 to go even higher. And if you look at scientific data from, for example, here on left, we can see from Harvard, a paper that shows that every 400 ppm increase in the indoor air will make us reduce our personal cognitive function by 20%. NASA and many other institutes have made similar studies. And uh, so basically people are more stupid indoors. And, and that sets thousands of dollars of loss for companies in offices. Next slide. And our solution to this is the uh, CO2 capture in the building ventilation on the inlet side. And, and for example, here on the left, we can see a system that can capture uh, from airstream of three cubic meters of air per second uh, CO2 away. And uh, it can capture up to 20 tons of CO2 per year. And that's equal carbon sink to three hectares of forest, for example, uh, Nordic forest age 30 to 50 years. Or uh, it's uh, like half of the building CO2 emissions. And uh, then if uh, this unit is not suitable for every building, then we have this on, on right, we can see an indoor air unit that it captures in a single room, but actually that unit cannot take a permanent CO2 capture. It will just uh, uh, be permanent, uh, temporary for one day and then it expels it over the uh, next night. Next slide, please. And here we have one example of a compact power to X system, which we built for Vartsila. Uh, this picture was taken last November in our own lab. Uh, it's a five meter long system which can capture CO2, make the electrolysis for hydrogen and then synthesize it into synthetic natural gas. And this unit is uh, revealed on the 1st of October in the Dubai World Expo. It will use that synthetic uh, natural gas to heat up the co tea for coffee and tea there at the Expo. So. This is a perfect example of power, compact power to X, what we can do. And in buildings, when the air is already moving, we should just capture that CO2 away at the same time. Thank you. Next slide. Okay, thank you very much, Petri. I think we can all relate <laughs> to your business situation very much. Uh, let's uh, open up then the panel discussion. And of course, if you would like to ask a question to any of our panelists, then as you have done already tonight, you can put that in your Q&A box and upvote any of the questions that you see already there. But I think I wanted to start really um, by kind of explaining to those of you who potentially don't know that this is you guys here today in this part of the the discussion you're like the second generation of companies to come from um air capture and and carbon removal um 10 years ago we heard of the first companies like climeworks and now suddenly there are so many more of you so what has changed you know, why is the market, you know, changing? Is this a reflection of the market? Matt, perhaps I can start with you. Sure. I mean, I think that, um, you know, what's changed is a, 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 a larger and broader understanding of the nature of the technical challenge. Um, uh, quite a bit of research and, and work has been done on um, demonstrating uh, the fundamentals of direct air capture. Um, so, uh, you know, I think it's uh, a lot of people are wakening up to the fact that, um, you know, it's a technology that, um, you know, is, is able in the near term to, to be commercialized and, um, you know, and even independent of the costs of, uh, of doing so, um, there are existing markets um, that where CO2, you know, offtake customers are paying quite high prices. And in scaling the technology and getting on the learning curve, as was discussed kind of in the earlier session and driving this price on over time, um, you know, it's, it, it, I think it appears to be, um, a, a, you know, a technology whose time has come, uh, independent of obviously the need to do so from, a, from, a, um, you know, from a, an atmospheric you know, CO2 concentration perspective, um, you know, the market is there, the technology is, 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 and is available. And, and is this in broad agreement with the other members of the panel here? Do we really see this as a kind of moment for change within the market? Yeah, I think so. Uh, oh, sorry, I didn't go ahead. Please go ahead. <laughs> uh, 
Sure. Uh, I, well, I, I guess I would. What I would add to that too is, you know, you know, for the when I was when I was in carbon engineering, we spent a lot of time literally, um, you know, educating, and I and I think that that was a difficult process. And it was a slow process, but it was necessary. It has been steady progress. But in the last couple of years, you know, a couple of things, obviously, some of them not so pleasant. I think that sort of the unavoidable um, uh, amount of climate catastrophes we're seeing on a regular basis is, uh, has finally got to, I think, the public's level of attention that they, they are asking their regulators to do something about it. And, and that's allowed, you know, again, for things like bipartisan support in the U.S. to start putting some real money into this. And, and, and I think that, you know, from an investment point of view, uh, capital was really tough to find, uh, you know, a decade ago. Now it's actually not. And I think that people have got past this idea that a regulated business is not investable. And I think they're realizing that the actual scale of this investment opportunity is, <clears throat> is, is actually very large. And, and, and so for me, that's a, you know, access to capital is, a, is one of the, probably the biggest changes that have come out that's going to allow, you know, again, the second generation of, of companies to start and out of the gate go a lot faster than the, than the original sort of 1.0 group of companies uh, did because they just didn't have the, the support. Thank you. Hans, did you want to, to continue that? Yeah, I, I agree um, on, on this point. And we see a, a huge market pool actually on direct air capture, which uh, wasn't there uh, five or 10 years ago when, when the 1.0 companies uh, started. Uh, I still admire the pioneer work that those companies did because it was in much tougher circumstances. I think there is a real market pool right now eh? um, and uh, technology has evolved, right? So there is money, of course, there is market pool and technology has evolved, of course, over the last 10 years, um, which, which makes more things possible from a technological point of view, eh? which allows us to actually reduce energy consumption to make more cost-effective uh, machines. So I think it's, it's a lot about uh, yeah, technology progress overall and and, uh, reusing, let's say, um, technology that has been developed sometimes for completely different purposes to reuse that actually for the purpose of direct air capture. Um, and um, yeah, the last 10 years, so many things have changed. Um, I think we're blessed that we can start this now, even though it remains very tough to do, but the conditions are definitely more favorable today than they were 10 years ago. It's very interesting because on one hand, all the questions that we had in, in the session one, it was very much about, you know, what's the cost price? You know, it seems to be almost a prohibitive um, or, or maybe a, it's a mindset. I don't know that, you know, people who are interested in this but don't want to take the step because of the cost. And yet on the other side, you're telling me that, you know, the, the capital is there, the, the, the access to that capital is there. So perhaps leaving aside the technology, what investment opportunities are actively available in this sector? That's a, a great question from, from our audience today. Uh, Nicholas. I mean, that's a really good question, right? I think there's, um, I think there's an interesting parallel that we, can draw, that we can draw from the renewable electricity industry in thinking about how we're actually going to be financing large installations of, these, of this kind of technology. And, and I think in the same way that PPAs and those agreements for, you know, upfront purchase for long periods of time of electricity at the standard price, in the same way here, I think actually, you know, pre-purchase agreements for large volumes of carbon dioxide removal are going to be really, really catalytic for us as companies to be able to go forward and say, we've solved the technology risks, we now have to implement this at scale and already have something which is a bankable proposition going to a financial institution of some kind. Now, I guess today there are a variety of different things available in terms of like policy um, initiatives that are being set up in the US, for example, and in the EU. And, you know, I think um, even, you know, even six months ago, no one would have predicted where the ETS price is right now, right? It's, it's just skyrocketed up. But particularly, we do need to see the realization of, of more funding opportunities for this kind of technology because it's something we need to scale rapidly and it's something that we need to do as quickly as possible and as many iterations as possible. I think one of the key things here is getting the technology on the ground and doing a kind of iterative technology development process. We won't be able to do that until we actually get down to, to actually building first of a kind plans. And I think that's the case for all of us here sat in this panel today. I don't know if anyone wants to add anything to that. Well, Petri, um, can I ask you what your, what your position is? Well, yeah, we we kind of tried to avoid discussing about the price of CO2 capture since we kind of have a bit different uh, business logic 
on, on, on the thing so that uh, we, we could sell this fresh indoor air as a service. And, and then the cost of CO2 capture is not, not the essence on that. Of course, the CapEx is still there. Does that, oh, I was going to say, does that make it more accessible then? Well, yeah, it's like uh, leasing a car. If, if you look at the car cost of buying that, it's, it's quite high, um, at least to some people. But if you are leasing it, it, it looks like uh, cheaper and, and you can afford it. So, so I would kind of compare it to that. And, and that, that kind of differentiates us from, from the others uh, that's done on, in purpose. And Shashank, you're, you have a very particular um, kind of attitude towards this kind of price cost thing. Um, you know, when we talk about, um, you know, d- deployment led innovation, how do we get that momentum to keep going so that we have, you know, the de- deployment so that the, the innovation can, can, can grow and, and can grow more cost effectively? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the way a lot of folks have, repeat, uh, you know, I don't want to repeat uh, everything that's been said around this, but, you know, I think we need to increasingly think about cost as a function of deployment. Um, if you want to reduce cost, deploy more. It's incredibly simple. Um, and why? Well, I mean, as you've seen in many industries, like, you know, the, the more we iterate, the more we deploy, you know, it's basically giving engineers more chances to design better, innovate better, and negotiate better with vendors. It's, it's very simple, right? It's, it's, um, so you just get more chances to reduce costs. And how do you get there? Just deploy more. Um, so, and I think, you know, Jigar Shah has sort of talked about de- deployment-led innovation. And I think, you know, it's going to take a little, a little while to get predictability of how, what the exact learning rates will be. You know, obviously there are some technologies that will win more than others. But generally for the industry, um, you know, if you want, if you desire low cost, like generally for the industry, like if, if, if you deploy more, cost will come down. Um, I think your question around investment opportunities, I think that, you know, obviously there's a lot more venture capital available at the early stages, and obviously a lot of R&D grants from the government <laughs> and so forth. Um, but I think there is still a big valley of death uh, around project financing, right? And we still need to do a lot of work around um, you know, carbon purchasing agreements like CPAs, the, the, the carbon version of the PPAs that um, and Nick was talking about. And, you know, we need to de-risk revenue streams. For, you know, we need to create predictable revenue streams so that we can go in and, and finance, raise debt to, to uh, finance CapEx for these initial deployments. So, you know, I think that's still a big question mark. Um, but I, I think we can solve it. And a lot of it is being driven by early cor- voluntary corporate corporate purchasers. Um, I think that's where folks can be really catalytic here right now. Okay, so we need a few more of the, the deals like Swiss Re has, has recently announced with Climeworks in order to maintain an momentum. But CapEx is a real issue. I mean, people get scared by CapEx. You know, the, the, the money that they have to maintain this kind of equipment, but you know, how, how would you allay their concerns there? Shashanka, I'll stick with you. Well, I mean, look at oil and gas industry, right? I was just hearing a stat the other day. There's hundreds of millions of dollars per day of CapEx that we install for oil and gas per day. Um, and I think, you know, yes, there is CapEx, but I think what's really important is cost per ton. Like you need to understand, you know, what is it amortized? What is the lifetime of the plant? How much, how much CO2 can you, can you, can you, can you, uh, capture per year over the last lifetime of the plant. Cost of debt becomes important. You know, um, you know. I think it's it's less so. You know, obviously, when you talk about capex, one thing that you should remember is is embodied carbon, right? Like you don't want to be just, you know, um, every capex that you install does have carbon. You can just like you know, if you if you uh, use a lot of steel, well, you know, the steel supply chain is not very good right now. It's very carbon intensive, so you need to account that into your life cycle analysis. From that angle, you should be very concerned. But I think, you know, from a cost perspective and, and a deployment perspective, like we've done this for many, many industries, right? Like, um, so I, I, yeah, I, I don't know how, why it would be different here. I'm curious to get other people's take on this. Well, let me open it up to the wider panel. Would anyone else like to jump in here? Yeah, if, if you look at the solar industry, for example, what happened there, I mean, <clears throat> originally they were a very expensive CapEx uh, industry, right? I mean, solar panels were a great technology. But they were always, um, um, I mean, they were very expensive, right? Very efficient way of converting 
uh, sunlight into electricity, but extremely expensive. Look at what happened the last 20 years. So I think very few people could have predicted what would have happened to the solar industry in this way. Um, and I see no single fundamental reason why a similar thing couldn't happen for, for direct air capture technology. Uh, it, it's all about um, upscaling the production and the deployment. And you see for the solar industry, of course, they received some, um, some help in the beginning with subsidies for people buying solar panels and deploying solar parks. Uh, but now you see that it can be done without any subsidy, right? These things pay back for themselves. Um, and I think um, similar things can happen um, with, uh, with, with this technology. So I'm, I'm not so much worried, to be honest, about, about the CapEx uh, part of this. Of course, initially for the initial deployments, yes, CapEx will be still relatively high. Um, but it has been mentioned before, it's all about upscaling mass production. Um, and again, I see no fundamental difference with what has happened in the solar industry for that matter. Thank you very much. Does anybody else want to jump in on this? I'm trying to get sure. my view so that I can see everybody's faces. Yes, please yeah. go ahead, Adrian. <laughs> okay, I, th I, think, I think it's also worth noting, <clears throat> you know, I think in terms of the problem we're trying to solve, you know, is, is, is a, you know, and it's, it's, it's a large scale problem we're trying to solve, but it's kind of on the same order of magnitude as the oil and gas industry. So there's around $30 trillion worth of infrastructure on the ground today that's, you know, that's, that's related to oil and gas. It's about a $3 trillion a year uh, business. And, and I think that when we look at, you know, 10 gigatons, even at $200 a ton, that's, that's a couple billion or a couple trillion dollars a year. So it's, it's of that same order of magnitude. And I don't think it should scare anybody or shock anybody to realize that to solve this problem is going to require an effort and an industry that's of the order of magnitude of the current oil and gas industry. So I think, you know, and then put it in perspective as well, when you kind of project this out to 2015, you, you know, I think that, uh, you know, the numbers I've seen are an expectation of around a $200 trillion GDP you're even at $200 a ton, you're talking about 1% of GDP. So this is not gonna bankrupt the world's economy. In fact, it's just gonna be a new industry that's gonna be additive. So I think from that perspective, I think if you just look at it sort of more globally, it really is a very tractable problem. All right, you mentioned 2050. Let me ask you then, Matt, where do you see the industry um, in, in the decades to come? Well, I mean, you know, as, as Adrian just said, it's been said before, I mean, I think in order in order to solve the problem and to avoid kind of the existential threat of catastrophic climate change, this has to become one of the world's largest, um, one of the world's largest markets. We'll be producing all of the carbon products that you know that we all rely on um, day to day, you know, from the air. And um, you know, I think that it'll be you know a basket of approaches um, with regards to direct air capture, with regards to carbon. To value, uh, it'll be large-scale, single-purpose-built uh, facilities uh, doing geologic sequestration. Larger, you know, larger-term, more kind of traditional EPC projects. It'll be smaller-scale, modular approaches that are solving, um, you know, unique problems or, or you know, maybe producing, you know, plastics from the air uh, someplace where it's just very expensive to get it to with traditional logistics uh, framework. So, you know, I, I think it's sort of hard to predict. Um, where direct air capture as an enabling technology is going to is going to go, but I think one thing is for certain is that um, it's going to be a very large market, and that our you know just look at thermodynamic you know energy embodied energy costs, the capex being aside, um, we will get to the point where this becomes quite uh, cost competitive against existing you know sources of carbon. What do you see as more important for the development of the industry? Is it these smaller scale projects or is it the big scale projects, Matt? I think it's both. I mean, I don't think that you can, you know, one without the other is I think a mistake. I think we have to, we have to iterate rapidly. Um, we have to try a lot of different things. Um, you know, we have to fail fast often and get back up and keep, keep going. Um, and we have to try to apply the technology in a lot of different application areas, uh, understanding that some of them will be big wins and some of them will be, uh, will be good efforts. Um, but you know, I, I, I do think that the large scale approach is quite important in order to demonstrate large scale drawdown, uh, in order to get on that learning curve, in order to address you know, historic CO2 emissions. 
uh, and in producing new materials. And I think a distributed modular scale approach is quite important as we can, you know, kind of start to address some of the edge market conditions and work our way towards the center. Okay, we've got loads of questions coming in. So maybe I just wanted to quickly grab from you before we move to the, the audience questions. Um, Nicholas, what, are, what is the biggest challenge facing your company right now when it comes to, to this project? I think the, one of the biggest challenges for us is, is actually around sort of engaging with, with governments and, and, getting, and, and getting the kind of understanding of what the technology is like, what it enables, what our vision for it is as an industry, is making sure there's that knowledge transfer through to the people who actually are decision makers. And I guess there are varying levels of understanding across different governments, but in terms of things like how do we simplify the permitting process for these technologies, you know, to make sure that it's kind of a separate process for DAC as it is for point source capture, you know, these shouldn't be lumped in as the same, the same approaches, right? But you often find sometimes from a regulatory perspective, this is, this is often the case, or there is no articulated view of what the requirements are going to be. And how do we just streamline this as much as possible? So, um, you know, make sure the financing's there, making sure, I think from a carbon credit, or, or as, as uh, Shishank was saying earlier about these CPAs, as we start to move to an environment where what is a relatively nascent market and we can all agree it's going to be very large but to make sure that there's um, a trajectory and understanding of how that's going to be formalized because to a certain degree it has to be formalized for us to understand and uh, make sure that everyone's work on the same playing field everyone's done the rules of regulations and that we have a kind of you know from a verifiable carbon removal perspective that we have standard reporting procedures so i think there's a lot of policy work to be done to enable this industry as well and, and forgive me if this is a crazy question, but I mean, when it comes to carbon removal, this is not something tangible. This is not something that people can see. This is not something, you know, that we can kind of get on board with if we can't see it. Um, do you think that lack of tangibility is, is, is a barrier at all when it comes to governments or when it comes to customers, when it comes to what you're actually trying to achieve? Petri, maybe sure. I can ask oh. you. Oh, I mean, yeah. please go ahead. No, 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 no. I'll uh, have some thoughts. <laughs> Petri, I think you should go. Well, yeah, uh, it's quite easy to measure the CO2. If you capture it, you know how many kilos you have. And if you turn it into valuable products, then you basically know how much CO2 is in those products and if you sell them. But like Nick just said, uh, there needs a lot of policy behind that so that it's, it's uh, verifiable and so on. So uh, governments <laughs> do things. Okay, so the tangibility is not really an issue. Yeah, at least I don't see it. And uh, <laughs> easy to measure how much you've captured and uh, how much is, it's in the air. So I don't see that at least a problem. Well, I, I do think there's an issue with the fact that it's a global problem and these are global emissions. And and so I think, you know, unlike some other like landfills and, and, and sewage treatment, all those other things which are really solving local problems, it is going to take an effort to realize that what you're doing is just you know, it, you need to do it, it's your responsibility, but you're, if your neighbor isn't doing it, you're not solving the problem. And I think that's a tough one that people are going to have to face is that, you know, they're going to have to accept that not everybody's going to play nice in this, but we still have to do the hard work. All right, thank you very much indeed. Uh, let's open the floor then to questions because we've got quite a few questions coming in. I'm just going to start at the top and, and kind of go through. And please forgive me if I don't ask the right person the right question, feel free to jump in um, if this is your speciality. Um, we talked about mineralization and I think that was, um, was it you, Adrian, that was talking about that earlier? You know, what is the trick to accelerate the mineralization, enhancing the surface? And if so, how is that achieved? And what is the corresponding energy penalty? So I think that was Shashank that was actually okay. talking about that. So I'll, I'll, I'll pass <laughs> that on. Yeah, we, we, we can't. We can't fully share everything, but um, in general, I think the idea is, is exactly what you mentioned, which is how do you expand the surface area contact uh, with the air as much as possible, right? Um, because essentially what we're doing is, um, you know, we don't use forced airflow. So we have a lot less frequency of CO2 molecules to hit, um, right? Generally you have, um, you know, for a Climeworks model, for example, you have a CO2 filter with, with a solid sorbent and you're um, blowing a bunch of air through um, and it takes about, I think 90 minutes or so for, for the cycle for us. Um, we don't have airflow. We want to effectively use wind to replenish the CO2. 
Um, so effectively that, that becomes a challenge of how do you increase the surface area on a particle level, but also on a, on, on a, on a, on a, um, you know, packing density and on a layer level, layer level. So there's many tunable parameters that, um, that affect it. Um, so, and I think we'll probably share more as we go on, but, um, you know, as, essentially we're trying to use, uh, weather, uh, to, to, um, try to get to that optimal amount, uh, optimal sort of microclimate. Um, to optimize for the um, pace of the CO2 uptake. Any other additions? Uh, the energy penalty, sorry, I didn't answer that question. So um, yeah, so we're, we're trying to use, so effectively like, you know, there's still no airflow. So it's, um, it's as, yeah, there, there's still uh, almost no energy on the front end, um, so. Okay, thank you very much. Anybody else want to jump in on that? All right, let's move on. And I think this one is for you, Adrian. How does the DAC process generally fit in the fluctuating production of renewables? Can renewables be used for the desorption of energy take up? Yeah, I, th I think that we're all going to face that same problem. And I think it's going to really come down to, you know, a, a question of, <clears throat> of either continuous operation with storage or intermittent operation. And I think because of capital utilization, you probably need storage. Um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, whether that's thermal uh, or whether that's electrical, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, I, I would say that uh, carbon capture is coming from a, a unique perspective with the sister companies that do both solar heat energy as well as energy storage. So, uh, you know, although we're not proposing that we're going to package those all together in every project, I think, I think that, uh, that ultimately that's going to be something that's going to be part of this mix. Now, I think that on the other hand, you know, there are some future options that are, you know, carbon-free electricity sources like 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 modular nuclear. Uh, there's obviously geothermal, which is which is very interesting, and I, I really appreciated the earlier uh, comments uh, from Climeworks on just the scale that even Iceland as a country could uh, could could manage. Uh, so I think that again, there's it's, it's 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 no different for director capture than it is with any other projects related to renewables. All right. Next up, we have uh, maybe we can do just do a show of hands for this one. Can we do direct air capture at scale in cities? If if it's a yes, raise your hand. Yes, from Matt, Petri, and Nicholas. I mean, Matt, you know, is that an, is that harder in cities or easier? <laughs> A little bit of both. I mean, you know, for example, um, using building HVAC systems, which are already pushing around air um, to, to run a direct air capture process is, you know, possibly some low hanging fruit. Um, I think there's a number of places where, um, you know, in particular, you know, cities are a large demand of the merchant CO2 market supply. So the closer you get to the customers, um, oftentimes the better your pricing can be. Um, you know, certainly it comes with other challenges, but I, I don't see any technical or commercial reason uh, why, you know, small scale modular direct air capture systems couldn't, um, couldn't achieve a reasonable and, you know, uh, an impactful scale within urban environments. Petri, you're agreeing? Yeah, yeah. Mainly because what we are doing. <laughs> yes, is in other buildings. Globally, there's a lot of buildings out there, and like Matt said, uh, ventilation units are many, many in in, in buildings, and uh, we truly believe so. Nick. Yeah, I think I just want to add there that you know the built environment is is form, is essentially a, a, um, a potentially a huge carbon sink. And what you're seeing is the, the rise essentially of technologies and companies injecting CO2 directly into building materials and then utilizing them actually to make homes and the buildings that we use every day. So an example, OCO technology in the UK uses um, CO2 with, with, fly, with flash to make synthetic limestone and make an aggregate. And this has already made something like enough uh, concrete blocks to make 8,000 three bedroom houses in the UK. And so, you know, um, whilst Building sites are being generally situated either on the outskirts or in the center of, of, uh, of cities. What you have the ability then to do is integrate with those technologies and companies. If you have a modular direct air capture technology, which can be decentralized and sort of drag and drop wherever you require. And then actually what you can do is turn the general building of cities, which is something we're probably not going to stop doing, into a huge carbon sink. So I do think there is a possibility for a variety of different direct technologies to integrate with our built environment and be doing direct air capture in, in the vicinity and in cities as well. 
I mean, uh, Hans, it's a question that was asked in the first session, you know, what is, where is the ideal location for your uh, direct air capture process? I mean, is there a specific place, cities, non-cities, is there a geographical preference? Well, I think that's one of the big advantages, of course, of direct air capture. You can do it anywhere where you need to use the CO2, right? So if you want to store it underground, uh, you will do it close by a storage facility. If you want to use geothermal energy, geothermal heat, you will do it uh, like, like in Iceland. Um, I mean, the atmosphere is one big, um, let's say, a bot of CO2, right? So everywhere you have roughly the same amounts of CO2, of course, except for in buildings. But I mean, outside, it's pretty much... Um, leverage uh, averaged uh, out let's say and the big advantage is that um, hey, you never need to transport it you can just put your direct air capture system on the location where you will use it for example if you want to make synthetic fuels with it you will actually co-locate it with uh, electrolyzer equipment so that you don't need to transport the co2 because transport of co2 is very expensive right um, so uh, in particular when we see that hey, there is a huge market potential for synthetic fuels uh, this will be made with um, very uh, cheap uh, renewable electricity in remote areas in this world. Um, we cannot afford transporting CO2 to those sites. You need to actually use CO2 from air produced on site in those remote locations. And that's the very big advantage because you have air everywhere. You have the CO2 everywhere. So I think uh, it depends a bit on the application, but it's a huge advantage that you can do direct air capture anywhere you, will, you would like to do it. I, I, I see the, the six of you in front of me and you've all coming at the same issue from different kind of angles. Um, I, there's a really good question here about with so many different solutions out there, how do we, can we achieve scale more quickly um, by agreeing on industry standards like we have, for example, in the solar industry? Shashank. So, so is the question about just general standards? For yeah, I think so. I mean, I think really, you know, is it is it possible to agree on on an industry standard, and would that help scale more quickly? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's there needs to be a lot more predictability around many things. Like, what does permanence mean? What does uh, verification mean? What what is a ton um, of of CO two removed? And I, I think across all these technologies, you know, you have various ways of going at it. Um, you know, what is what, what is an okay life cycle analysis? Um, you know, I think sort of Kleinbrooks talked about um, less than 10% of emission going into the energy uh, for every ton of uh, CO2 removed. So, you know, I think we all need to converge on those standards. And I think that is important and that will unleash more liquidity, liquidity, liquidity more financing, more predictability for how this will all, all turn out. Um, I think not, not just for direct or capture, I think you sort of zoom, zoom out, it's even more important to get those standards across all carbon removal technologies. Um, it, because especially, you know, if you look at sort of uh, VEX or, you know, other, other types of uh, carbon removal, um, and I think there's, you know, there's sort of benefits and, and costs for each one of them. Um, I think, you know, within DAC, there is a lot more uniformity ar around, so uh, like land use, um, or, or, or permanence, for exa example, if you're, if you're only doing uh, negative emissions. So, yeah, I, I think, you know, I, I think this, this is likely an effort that needs to be driven by the governments um, and, and, and potentially with NGOs. Um, so, yeah. Which governments do you see leading the way here? Um, I hope that Department of Energy in the U.S. Um, takes a crack at it and hopefully with a, a couple, you know, like there's a lot of great folks they are sitting there right now who have really good thoughts around it. I think it's really just about how do you involve the right NGOs uh, like Carbon 180, for example, for carbon removal. Um, you know, how do we all come together as, as stakeholders to come up with those standards? Because I, I think, you know, I, I haven't met anyone who, who hasn't said, you know, that this is important, right? Um, so we, I, th I think there's a lot of interest in doing so. Um, so if the US leads and hopefully, you know, other, other folks can, can join as well. Um, so, yeah. what about you, Petri, um, Matt, uh, Nick? How are your countries um, dealing with this? How receptive are governments to to what to what you're doing? Well, if I, I'll start uh, in Finland, we have a like an investment subsidy for new new equipment, and that's pretty good for the new first new equipment. You can get a pretty high subsidy 
and even the solar panels will get an investment subsidy nowadays. So whichever technology it is, uh, the, uh, the government is subsidizing the first units quite well. Um, let's say three years ago, speaking about DOC, you could be uh, said that you are not that wise if you are trying to do that, but the wind have, has changed a bit over the years. So nowadays, uh, also the DAC is in, in, in discussion. Thank you. What about the UK? Yeah, I think the UK is um, an interesting one because what we're seeing in the UK is the rise of, of a lot of uh, CCS networks where we're able to hopefully from, uh, from industrial emissions decarbonize those, the, the I think I'm going to step in here, Nick, because we can't hear you, or maybe it's me. Um, so I'm just going to stop you and maybe. Other things like, yeah. Okay. Uh, so let's maybe take, take a pause in that, and hopefully it's not me, um, and then we'll carry on. I have another question here. Which companies here? Uh, in our panel are well suited to operate intermittently to follow at low energy availability, both from a process perspective and from a business perspective. Uh, yeah, I think we are, I mean, from a technology point of view, it's no problem to work intermittent, but of course, if you want to make that cost effective, you need to have a very low CapEx, right? Um, hey, if the machine is only operating a thousand hours uh, a year, for example, because of intermittency, Obviously, the capex cost will uh, really uh, cost you a lot in terms of uh, cost per ton of CO2. So there, I think the, the, the clue is to uh, actually get that capex cost as low as possible. Uh, I think many processes are, are really compatible with intermittency. It's a matter of getting the capex cost down to make that economically feasible. Thank you very much. Um, Anna, can you hear me? Yes, I can now. Can you hear me now? Fantastic. Yes. Because I would also like to jump in on that. Okay, so, yes, please go. Um, I guess one of the, the advantages of our technology is that we have this kind of dynamic electrical chemical, electrochemical separation process. So um, we're actually able to scale up and scale down energy consumption as we kind of view the curtailment of renewables actually as kind of an opportunity rather than a, rather than a problem. But um, I guess maybe I'll just finish on where the UK is as well, or do you just want to yes, move on? Yes, please do, no. Sure. So, you know, the UK is doing something very interesting that they're doing um, quite bold development projects and funding the, both the feasibility studies and then hopefully in kind of phase two projects and the actual first of a kind plants of the implementation of, of, the, of these technologies. And I guess one other interesting thing we're seeing is that across industries in the UK, we're seeing the rise of CCUS networks at a number and scale that I don't think we're really seeing anywhere else in the world. So the ability to tie together entire industrial clusters, which in the UK are quite, quite co-located with each other, and um, essentially build the piping, CO2 piping infrastructure to repurpose uh, oil, depleted oil and gas wells, a -line sac, uh, saline aquifers in the North Sea, and turn these actually then into very large carbon sinks. So our view is that actually within the UK, you know, there's huge potential for large scale carbon removal. But you just need a DAC technology that can do it. Thank you. Um, who here sees any value in the use of captured solid carbon, for example, for soil enhancement or other uses? Is, is it that we just have to store it underground and be done with it? Or, or are there other potential uses for carbon post capture? Well, I think like the, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take this. So I think, okay. I think obviously <clears throat> when we look at uh, <clears throat> things for carbon other than sequestration from a product's point of view, yeah, I think fuels is probably the one that uh, is sort of top of list. If you look at, you know, like what percentage of, of hydrocarbons are, are going into the transportation sector, it's like 90%. So I think that, you know, looking at fuels as a, as a strategy in terms of more mitigation than negative emissions is, uh, is certainly one that's, that's really critical and, point, and, and important. And, you know, in, in terms in terms of soil amendments and some of the biological ones, you know, that's not my field of expertise, but I still think the jury's out a little bit in terms of permanency. And I think that's a really hard one to track and a really hard one to project forward, you know, a, a century to understand, you know, the stability issue with, with that. So um, I think, but I do think that, you know, like, you know, the, the, the displacement of, of hydrocarbons is going to be essential because I think from an application point of view, there's just such a large segment of the transportation sector that ultimately ultimately is going to benefit from the continued use of liquid hydrocarbons. 
Thank you. Um, so I, I think, th please. To quickly answer that, I think by far the majority of the CO2 we capture from the air is going underground. Like it's just thermodynamically, you know, there's not many interesting things that you can actually sequester, like try to create carbon negative products, like if negative emissions is the goal. Um, and I think that's one of the things we need to keep in mind. Like if, if it's billions of tons of CO2 that we need to be removing, like it's all about scale cost per ton. You know, you asked a question about you know, whether it can be in the cities. Sure, it can be in cities, but electricity prices in the cities are very, very high, right? Um, so if you use energy to product, sure. I mean, there's probably some niche applications in the cities, um, but you know, almost by far the majority of carbon is, is gonna be sort of, you know, um, in, in places where, you know, land is cheap, uh, electric and power is very cheap um, and, and you're sequestering most of that underground. So that's the only way, that, that's sort of the, by far the majority way you, you can get to that type of billions of tons of CO2 at scale, right? I mean, you can talk about all these sort of niche sort of utilization applications, but fundamentally it's, it's a lot of it is going underground. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, I have a, a couple of questions on how your industry kind of works together. Matt, is there much sharing of um, knowledge going on or is it so new that everybody's very protective of their knowledge? Oh, I mean, <laughs> I think a little bit of both. Uh, <laughs> certainly, you know, there's a lot of collaboration happening in the space. You know, I think philosophically, um, you know, getting on, doing lots of projects, uh, you know, sharing market information, um, looking at different technology approaches and systems approaches and how to integrate with the technologies. And certainly there's a huge amount of work and collaboration with um, companies in the CO2 to product space, CO2 to value space, looking at how do you electrochemically reduce CO2? How do you convert CO2 into products, plastics, materials, building materials, carbon fibers, all these kinds of things. So I think, um, you know, there's a, there's a natural sort of evolution of, of this dialogue and you know certainly in the scientific literature and uh, conferences and the work that doe and others are doing um there's quite a bit of of you know kind of fundamental sharing around um around process development and around um you know expectations of where the technology can be how it's going to scale what we need to do in terms of manufacturing to get to these scales things like this thank you um, actually, just following on from that, um, we just had a question there to say that, you know, why can't we then just kind of gather all the information together and instead of, you know, coming up with six different solutions, actually just unite and, and come up with one clear solution? I, I guess that's, that's, I think <laughs> that's a kind of crazy question, but um, yes, Hans. Yeah, I, I think it's just uh, a good thing, right? That there is many different initiatives um, uh, because I think it's it's too early to tell right now, you know, um, um, uh, which ones are going to make it, which ones are not going to make it. Uh, hopefully, most of us are going to make it, and that would be the best thing. But at this stage, you can't really say like, uh, let's pick that one because that's the one that's going to make it. I think. Uh, the strength uh, of the industry has always been to follow different paths. And that's also the most, uh, the, the best way of doing it, because that's the best guarantee that eventually uh, there will be a technology that can actually, that can do that in a cost effective way, hopefully more than one. Uh, but uh, this diversity and these different initiatives, I think it's, it's a blessing um, uh, that it's there. And, and as we indicated, um, I mean, there is plenty of capital in this world to finance these initiatives. Um, it would be a problem, of course, if, if all of us would be uh, undercapitalized and, and in trouble and, and close to bankruptcy. But uh, I mean, as long as these different initiatives can be financed, I think it's, it's a blessing that they can be there. And of course, we should work together on aspects where, where we have a common ground. Um, I think creating more awareness at the political level, uh, and at other uh, levels to make sure that um, we, we um, and that direct air capture is actually embedded in major energy transition plans. Because let's be honest, right now, direct air capture is not yet part of major energy transition plans. Uh, flue gas capturing is in some countries, eh, but, but direct air capture is still seen as something unknown eh, because there are still many questions around 
the technology and the cost of the technology. So I think from a political level, uh, people look at it as, okay, maybe this might be something, but it's for sure not like wind turbines and solar panels and batteries and flue gas capturing. And we're not yet at that level. And there, I think we should, of course, work together to increase the awareness that this is possible and it's for sure worth a shot. Uh, but, but let's be ourselves, let's say. Uh, I think the diversity is for sure a, a blessing. And of course, summits like this always help with the, the, the discussion and the transfer of ideas and the conversations, absolutely. Um, I have a, an interesting question here from Philip. It's a, it's a kind of poll suggestion, and I guess you can raise your hand. If you believe uh, DAC will reach uh, less than $100 per tonne unsubsidized by 2040, please raise your hand. Oh, we have 100% then. I'm not included, obviously. Um, so you're all convinced of this? Absolutely. Yeah, would... absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's for sure feasible. Um, also looking at uh, fundamental laws of physics and chemistry, I think, yes, this is feasible. Uh, uh, there is no doubt that this will uh, happen. Yeah, and I think it's you know feasible for sure. And I think the the good thing is I, I don't think that it's necessary. I think that uh, you know we've talked about sort of the economics and the math is that a hundred dollar very affordable option. So, so I, th I think from that perspective, yeah, it's you know, and, and I think with all the shots on that, I mean, like using a Canadian analogy, um, you know, I, th I think there's no question that uh, there's going to be multiple pathways to get to that number. Okay, I think that was a, a great question, actually, to wrap things up on. Uh, thank you all so much for your insights. And again, I'm, I'm really sorry that we didn't get to all the questions. Uh, but obviously, we've got another whole day of networking and discussion to look forward to tomorrow. So I hope that many uh, more of your questions will be answered then. Um, just to let you know that all of the slides that you've seen today, and this whole recording is going to be sent out to all participants in the coming days after the close of uh, the event. So you can look forward to that. Tomorrow, we're going to discuss and um, focus more on how companies can actually take real action towards this net zero goal or whatever kind of path they, that they are on. The doors will open at half past one physically. Virtually, we'll be live at 2.30. And that is, of course, Swiss time in the afternoon. And we're going to hear leader, from leaders in the field from ETH Zurich, Swiss Re, Shopify, and many, many more. So I know already some of the questions we've had today are going to reappear tomorrow for our wonderful panels. Uh, gentlemen, have a wonderful evening. Thank you to all uh, our audience for sticking with us. Um, and we'll see you back tomorrow. Bye-bye. <laughs>